Harish, I am uh, waiting for your uh, signal. I think you can start, sir. I think we are already live, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Okay. Sir, actually, we are making it Facebook Live. So just a uh, oh, okay. few seconds here. Okay. Okay, so uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Myself, Neeraj Aroda, I am Senior Director at SHM and to after the Water Council of SHM. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of SHM for this uh, water webinar series. So friends, uh, as you all know that SHM and Sakshin Mantra, they are jointly organizing a water webinar series. And today is our uh, second session of this uh, webinar series. So on the eve of uh, World Water Day on 22nd March, SHM and Sakshin Mantra created an online webinar series. And the theme of this series is Water Stress and Emerging Strategic Business Risk. So there are the and out of which uh, webinar session one, which was on achieving water security by optimizing water demand, was conducted on uh, 22nd March. And today is our uh, second session. And the theme of this session is regenerating water through reuse, recycling, and recovery technologies. And for this session, we have uh, wonderful speakers, starting with uh, Mr. A. Murli Dharan, who is Deputy Advisor, Department of Drinking Water and Sanitation. Ministry of Jal Shakti, Government of India. We have uh, Mr. Ajay Popert, who is the Chairman of SHM Council on Water and is the President of Iron Exchange India Limited. We have with us uh, Mr. Aniket, who is the Regional Sales Manager, Pure Water. And Mr. Sujoy, who is the Co-Founder, Business Tech uh, System, Private Limited. And we have with us uh, Mr. Shalendra Singh, who is the Member of SHM Council on Environment and Climate Change and is the Founder and CEO of Sustain Mantra. Mr. Shalendra is the moderator for the day also. So, uh, Shalendra ji, welcome you and would, I would request you to please uh, moderate the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Neera ji, for, uh, for that quick uh, background on the series, webinar series, and uh, a very warm welcome uh, to all the attendees uh, and particularly to our distinguished guests and panelists. Thank you so much uh, for taking your time out. And I hope that the next hour, hour and 15 minutes uh, will, be, will be productive and when, um, in, in appreciating the context of water uh, as it emerges becoming uh, a, a significant risk. Uh, most of us would be aware that, uh, you know, the government of India and our honorable prime minister uh, has done a lot of work and initiated a lot of programs uh, recognizing that uh, India as a country is water stressed and that uh, it's an important resource not only for industry but also uh, for the common man and and really it is about survival and it's the very essence of life itself. So without you know sort of uh, uh, taking too much, um, away, I would like to first invite, you know, our uh, Mr. Ajay Popat, uh, if he is there. Right. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Ajay Popat is the chairman of the Asocham Council on Water. Uh, plus, he is also the president of Iron Exchange India Limited. Mr. Ajay Popat is a, 
uh, engineering uh, graduate in plastics technology from UK and an MBA in marketing and strategy from NMIMS Institute. He has over 40 years of experience in various op uh, various aspects of operating uh, company and he has worked uh, in several leading organizations uh, during his tenure. Uh, he has also been very successful in managing a joint venture between Iron Exchange and a leading Belgium company. Under his leadership as a CEO uh, of this joint venture, he has created uh, uh, several uh, uh, several initiatives in the field of water and uh, we really look forward sir for your welcome address uh, as well as for setting a little bit of the context for the webinar today uh, over to you sir yeah thank you very much uh, Mr. Singh, for uh, the introduction uh, can i have uh, uh, can i please share uh, my presentation please <coughs> Uh, can you give me the sharing rights, uh, Mr. Arora? Yeah, thank you so much. So, Mr. Singh, I have uh, uh, preferred to make a presentation. Uh, uh, okay. So, also stepping in as uh, one of the speakers to add value to this uh, 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 seminar number two of uh, sure. uh, uh, ASOCHAM. So I'll sure. speak for about uh, 15 minutes uh, as, uh, uh, you know, like what I presented last time. And I'm sure. going to start with my screen share. There is some slight internet issue at this Switch off your video so the audio will improve, sir. Ajay. All right, I'll do that. Just switch yeah. off your video. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll we, do that. We, we can see. Video. We can see your slides, uh, Ajay ji. Yeah. So, but I'll stop. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll stop my video as uh, what uh, Mr. Arora says. So, am I uh, audible and am I clear now? Yes, you are very audible, and we can see Perfect, your slides. Sir. Okay. Please go ahead, sir. Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. Just just give me a minute, please. Because I'm not able to remove the window, which is interfering with my slide presentation. Uh, well, anyways, OK, so uh, welcome to the webinar series two uh, organized uh, uh, by ASOCHEM on this particular day and uh, in uh, Consistent with the theme of uh, uh, the webinar too, uh, I'll be taking you uh, through the concept of uh, uh, effluent uh, recycle reuse, starting with uh, the genesis of this concept, uh, which uh, incidentally uh, uh, the credit goes to my company, but it is still uh, as new as it was, uh, let's say about 25 years back when we introduced the concept. So with that, and you know, talking about uh, so the case studies, uh, uh, I'll uh, complete my keynote speech. Uh, the concept is of integrated water management, whether we call it as recycle or reuse, uh, but broadly uh, what it means is uh, 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 the integrated water management. And uh, what it means is that if you look at the conventional way of treatment, uh, this is something which we used to talk 25 years back, Mr. Singh and the panel and the people who are listening to my presentation. And it is still valid for large number of uh, medium and small scale industries and many of the uh, 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 large scale industries also. Where raw water is treated in a water treatment plant, the treated water uh, is used for the process. Uh, the process uh, uh, produces effluent and also there is a utility which produces effluent uh, from the cooling towers, blow down from the boiler water treatment or maybe the treated effluent. And uh, it goes to an effluent treatment plant and uh, after treating the effluent to meet the discharge norm, it is discharged. Uh, the concept what we talk of is uh, essentially uh, integrated solution where uh, uh, once again raw water is used uh, uh, is treated in a water treatment plant the treated water is used in the process as well as the utility uh, from there 
uh, we have uh, the first intermediate stage of product recovery because the scenario for the next 10 years when it comes to water management is uh, not only increasing the efficiency uh, in terms of water use uh, and reducing the cost of uh, 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 recycled water the concept is of uh, product recovery because it adds a lot of value and it reduces the cost of treatment as i'll show you in some of the examples that i'll present subsequently so in the product recovery plant one recovers the product so for example if someone is producing uh, uh, let's say uh, denim uh, uh, jeans as what we call okay and it uses indigo dye so the process will produce a dark blue color because of indigo dye a very small percentage but it becomes very dark so while you will have all your parameters like bod and cod uh, in place in your treatment plant the blue color uh, you know uh, would be very uh, obvious uh, despite you meeting the standards of organic so we set up a product recovery plant to recover indigo dye uh, thereby uh, reducing the operating cost of the downstream waste treatment plant and recovering the product also means that you are now having efficiency enhanced in your uh, manufacturing process because which was going as a waste is now recovered and the partially treated effluent uh, then goes to a zero liquid discharge plant, no longer an effluent treatment plant as in the conventional way. And uh, uh, one can recover anywhere between 95 to 98 percent water, as I will show you in the couple of presentations that I'm going to share with you. And this water is reused back uh, for uh, as a source water, thereby in the whole process, uh, having source reduction, uh, product recovery, uh, waste minimization and uh, complete, almost complete uh, water reuse uh, by adopting uh, uh, zero liquid discharge processes. So we promoted this concept very aggressively and uh, over the years we have now more than about 100 working references uh, based on this concept across all industries and uh, we have more than about uh, uh, 20 zero liquid discharge uh, systems installed also across all the industries. Uh, from concept to commissioning, uh, it's not a very uh, uh, simple step, and we prefer to work uh, in a very uh, close way with our uh, customers. If someone comes and says that, okay, please send us an inquiry, please send us a proposal for a waste treatment and recycle plant tomorrow, uh, even if it is something which we have done for many years, uh, we would not accept uh, such a request coming to us because each effluent is different. Even coming from the same industry, its characteristics are different. The way it is treated before it goes for recycle is different. So we prefer to do uh, the initial assessment uh, uh, working with the customer where the client provides us the necessary information about uh, his uh, effluent quality, volume of effluents, uh, state of existing effluent treatment plant with respect to mechanical, electrical and even civil. Uh, our experts also provide initial analysis and comments on what is shared by the client including a site visit to assess physically the condition of the plant. The next thing is uh, we collect uh, grab samples. Uh, here we are talking of lab test of grab samples because we don't just take one sample and base our design completely on uh, uh, one such sample. So we typically collect uh, something like about six to eight samples over a period of month. And we uh, uh, normalize the data with respect to the effluent parameters by doing this test in our uh, setup. Uh, what we also do is the treatability in order to see uh, whether the effluent can be treated best by chemical process, it can be treated best by biological process, and after that, which is the best membrane uh, uh, in order to uh, recycle or reuse the effluent. Uh, then there is proof of concept. This is not for all the cases, but for cases which are uh, exceptional, where we have not worked before uh, in the lab, it shows that, you know, uh, we cannot straight away uh, provide a process scheme. We prefer to do pilot testing uh, at the client's end in order to do the confirmation of uh, application feasibility. Post that, uh, it takes about four to six months in case if it's a new effluent or something that we have not done. We don't do this much often these days unless you know the effluent is very, very different than our prior experience and we need to uh, establish the proof of concept. And post that, uh, you know, uh, uh, there is a full scale plant. Uh, so this is our in-house expertise. This is the collaboration that we seek with the industry. Uh, 
the time period can be anywhere between one to two years or even six months, uh, depending upon uh, uh, you know the process and the cooperation that we get from the customers. And adapting this uh, uh, methodology, uh, none of our hundred plus recycle plants have failed. They are all working very successfully with the customers. The customers are very happy in terms of getting the benefit out of these plants. And this is because we go about doing things in a very methodical way, despite uh, our uh, uh, experience that we have in the business. Uh, I'll take you to uh, uh, some case studies now uh, with respect to effluent recycle. Uh, I'm taking this case of Reliance uh, uh, Jamnagar uh, uh, because you know one of the most difficult effluents to be treated is a refinery effluent. Difficult from the perspective, uh, not only because of the constituent of this effluent, which typically has a high amount of oil, free oil, emulsified oil, soluble oil, then it has a high amount of suspended solids, of course, it has high amount of organics, BOD, COD, uh, ammonical nitrogen, uh, but it also has compounds like phenol, mercaptans, uh, thiocyanides, sulfides, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And again, depending upon the type of uh, crude that you'd use, uh, this constituents would vary. So, treating a refinery effluent successfully uh, up to the level of uh, near ZLD or recycle is a very challenging thing because. Not only you are uh, 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 challenged with uh, several uh, effluent parameters which needs to be treated before the uh, treated effluent can be reused, but also there is tremendous amount of variation in the quality and the quantity of effluent depending upon the campaign that you're running, uh, campaign in terms of the type of crude. So if you use Brent crude, which is sweet crude, uh, you know, uh, your effluent treatment plant receives least amount of uh, 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 contaminants in the after the refining process, but if you use SAR crude or DOBA crude, which is cheap, uh, you know you would uh, have effluents with high amount of uh, uh, values in terms of uh, contaminants. Whereas the effluent treatment plant that you build is uh, you know fixed in terms of volume, in terms of area. So it's very important to do the analysis as I showed in the previous slide, understanding the effluents, sitting together with the customer and then designing uh, a waste treatment plant. And this is precisely that uh, Iron Exchange, Reliance Industries, and their consultant uh, Bechtel in UK did. They spent close to about six months uh, uh, discussing this. It's not that for the first time Reliance was setting up such a uh, plant, uh, but here there was a difference because this plant was going to be a zero liquid discharge plant. So we sat down together uh, and uh, we uh, decided as how the system should be designed. And I'll take you through uh, uh, the output of uh, uh, a very successful installation. So uh, uh, we classified uh, the effluent streams into four different types. So we had low TDS uh, effluent streams. So we had uh, two streams of low TDS. So they contained uh, TDS less than about 1,000. Then there was an oily water stream, uh, which had high amount of oil going right up to about uh, 1 lakh ppm or 20,000 ppm, ranging between that. And then there was a high TDS stream, which had, uh, as the name suggests, high amount of TDS. And it had also phenol, thiocyanide, uh, sulfates, etc., etc. So we decided to also uh, make four identical stream, because sometimes, uh, and each of the stream was of about 500 meter cube per hour. But we decided that all this could be interchangeable, and that's where uh, our uh, uh, modulation and the design uh, came into the picture. That if you don't have uh, uh, too much of LTDS and if you have more of OWS, this particular stream would now receive OWS and it will start treating OWS effluent. If you had high amount of HTDS and low amount of TDS, then you would have two streams of HTDS converted from one of uh, these two LTDS and working. If you have more of OWS, which has not happened so far, uh, you could have converted any of the stream uh, into OWS. So there was interchangeability, which was also built in the plant, which was also completely uh, automatic in design. So uh, the identical streams were designed to remove free oil <coughs> using pre oilers and API separators. Uh, there was a physical chemical treatment process, uh, uh, flash mixes, coagulation, neutralization, DAF, essentially to remove suspended solids, to remove dissolved, uh, 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 to remove emulsified oil, uh, and also along with that, uh, a certain portion of uh, organics. We had a two stage biological treatment plant, one which used uh, a bio tower, uh, 
thereby consuming 50% less energy to distract the COD and reducing uh, about 50% COD in the design, whereas in practical purpose in the bio tower, we got 70% reduction. As all of us know, maximum amount of energy is consumed in the biological treatment process. So by doing this, we reduce the energy cost to distract the organics plus uh, compounds like phenol, thiocyanide, ammonia, etc. And then we had extended aeration uh, and the clarifier uh, in order to uh, remove all BODs, CODs, uh, suspended solids. Uh, in this section, we removed all types of oils. And we polished it with uh, a dual media filter and an activated carbon filter, not for chlorination, but essentially to remove balanced COD, which could pass through biological treatment process, what is generally referred to as recalcitrant COD. So we use spatial carbon columns, which could absorb this uh, uh, organics. And these steps were necessary because the final step was to take the effluents to a uh, membrane system. And as all of us know, uh, the limiting condition of RO membrane is there should be nil suspended solids, nil oil and grease, nil BOD, COD, nil chlorine, only TDS. So all this was necessary in order to see that the downstream membrane process uh, uh, treats the effluent for TDS and recovers uh, close to about 80% of the effluent. And uh, the system was set up. Uh, I will not go through this. I've already explained all these things during my talk. Now, apart from uh, recovering uh, almost uh, uh, all the water, uh, which is then used for uh, cooling tower makeup and is also used for the RO treated water is used for the process. Uh, the balanced water is used for cooling tower and thereby making this plant uh, completely zero liquid discharge. Not a single drop is discharged from this uh, 2000 meter cube per hour or 48 MLD uh, complex effluent treatment plant. Apart from that, we also managed the uh, solid waste generated in the process. So for example, there was skimmed oil during the chemical treatment process. Uh, so we use heat treatment in a slow folding tank and we had an emulsion break, uh, breaking tank and we recovered oil, which was transferred to refinery. As I said earlier, the concept of recovery is very, very important while uh, also adapting uh, uh, recycle or zero. Drip. So here we are recovering oil. Uh, then there was oily sludge at the bottom of the settling tanks and the thickness, which uh, had a floating sludge. So uh, we thickened the sludge and it was transferred to the dealer coker unit. So this was again an example of reuse of a byproduct. And then there was a biological sludge because there were two types of sludge, chemical sludge, and then there was a biological sludge. And of course, there was an oily sludge also. So it was th thickened, stabilized, uh, dewatered, and then sent off to secured landfills. So we recovered almost all water and we also ensured that there was a reuse of uh, oil uh, from a large amount of oil that goes to an effluent treatment plant in a refinery. The second example is uh, of uh, uh, you know a project that we built with uh, uh, Hindustan Mittal uh, Energy Limited Refinery. Uh, here we used a very advanced membrane bioreactor technology to retrofit an existing biological plant to improve the quality of water uh, uh, post uh, the aeration treatment uh, through an MBR process with a capacity of something like about 12 MLT. So uh, here the COD, even after the aeration system was very high, 250 to 400, uh, making the downstream membrane processes uh, ineffective because of contamination with uh, excess COD, ammonia, and also oil and grease. And these are the parameters uh, that we have guaranteed for the performance. The plant is uh, ready and is going to be commissioned anytime in a extremely compact footprint, uh, as you see over here, uh, you know, this MBR modules uh, were put up. So this is one of the advanced technology that we have done. Uh, we have largest uh, uh, number of working references for recycle and generally reliance. I talked about India synthetic rubber, which is a IOC Marubini joint venture to produce synthetic rubber. SDR uh, have installed a complete ZLD, uh, biological process membrane evaporators. Gulf Floor, a leading company in UAE, has a ZLD plant installed by us. Uh, Bosch has a complete ZLD installed by us. One of the earliest ZLD plant that we built was for wholesome cement. And recently, we have uh, also commissioned plants for Goodless Nerolek, Complete ZLD, Patanjali uh, in Haridwar, uh, where they make all types of FMCG products. We have installed a complete ZLD. We also have a very unique anaerobic reactor here because the effluent had very high amount of COD, so which distracts the COD and also produces biogas. So that is what uh, we recover here in terms of biogas, and it's a complete ZLD plant like all other plants. Uh, 
uh, with Kia Motors, uh, we uh, commissioned a complete zero liquid discharge, and we got several references with companies in the brewing industry, Carlsberg, United Breweries, uh, all their plants, the ZLG has been built by us. So uh, we also done uh, sewage recycle plants. I'll not go into this. Uh, uh, we also have large number of seawater desalination plant. All this put together constitutes to be alternate sources of water along with treated effluent. And uh, we provide complete automation systems like this is uh, 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 our system which is installed uh, for all cooling tower systems, all effluent treatment plant systems in order to you know uh, measure uh, the parameters uh, According to the parameters, dose the chemicals, just not continuously dose the chemicals, but measuring days upon demand, dose the chemicals, recording the performance of the systems uh, 24 by 7, and building up a database uh, through which uh, the future algorithms of treatment can be done. Since it's remote monitored, uh, you know, the interface can be given on someone's mobile to check conductivity, ORP, pH. The levels of inhibitors or chemicals, uh, uh, temperature, uh, the LSI, the dispersant levels required, level sensors, you can have a variety of parameters that you could check uh, on your mobile. And the one which is not conforming uh, would be uh, uh, shown up or flagged into the red. So a lot of references here, all backed by uh, one of the best uh, uh, and the only state of the art membrane manufacturing plant in Goa producing the complete range of membranes since last almost two years, uh, thereby making the recycle concept even more competitive with indigenous membrane, uh, which not only are as good or better than important membranes, but are available ex stock and at a very competitive price. So uh, we have been very successful promoting these membranes, uh, large number of references for seawater, partial treated sewage for reuse, uh, for recycle and ZLD all backed by our design centers uh, to do the complete engineering of the plant using advanced softwares for civil engineering, mechanical and electrical and instrumentations, 3D drawings for all plants or all jobs that we secure in order to see that there is absolutely no mismatch short supplies when the plant goes for uh, commissioning. This we do this actually at a proposal stage in order to not make any mistakes during our estimations, etc. Backed by stringent quality control and third party inspections and agency. Following EHS practices, not only in our manufacturing, but also at our project sites along with the customers and backed up by one of the best 24 by 7 services uh, through which we are operating and maintaining close to 12,000 industrial water and waste treatment plant with 30% uh, of our 1500 crore revenue coming from services. Thank you very much. Uh, the whole synopsis here was that uh, to make recycle success, it requires the cooperation of a customer, uh, like a doctor and a patient. It requires in-depth study and uh, good engineering. It requires a lot of experience to design, build, engineer large plant. And more than that, complete automation as well as uh, uh, service capability to troubleshoot and uh, service response. These are the ingredients which make the recycle concepts successful and adaptable in India. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Ajay Popa. It was really fascinating to see the level of technology and diligence and, uh, and effort that is required. And in, I think your uh, example of the Reliance uh, uh, case was particularly fascinating. Thank you so much uh, for giving us that uh, insight into uh, you know the kind and level of technology that is available today and should be deployed for a valuable resource like water. Uh, with that, uh, it's my pleasure uh, now also uh, to invite our chief guest for the occasion, um, Sri Mr. A. Murli Dharan. Uh, who is the Deputy Advisor, Department of Drinking Water and Sanitation, Ministry of Jal Shakti, Government of India. Mr. Murli Dharan is working with DDWS since 2018 and has been involved in Jal Jeevan mission from its launch. He has 27 years experience in water resources and water supply sector at field and at policy level. Um, uh, work experience with Central Water Commission, TN Tamil Nadu Water Resource Organization for nine years, dam safety, water resource, uh, and also worked with um, multilateral agencies like World Bank, ADB, states and central ministries in the Planning Commission of India. Uh, his, his resume 
uh, really uh, is very, very impressive. I'm sure most of you can read what is there on the screen. Uh, and without, you know, sort of a further delay, may I invite you, sir, to give us your um, uh, keynote address uh, uh, on the subject of the webinar today. Sir, you're can, muted. Sir. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Please go yeah. ahead. Okay. So, uh, first of all, my sincere thanks to uh, the Ashokam for giving us an opportunity uh, to place our point of view. And I would like to congratulate the Ion Exchange President for the excellent presentation. Perhaps it was a very good learning thing for us also, sort of work that is actually being done by the Ion Exchange on ground, uh, which Ashokam is also a partner to, which is really wonderful to note so i would like to place you know a bigger perspective of how actually water is becoming a sort of a you know constraint in terms of both for livelihood as well as for businesses and other aspects of life no let water my uh, talk will be just uh, on this basis i would give a broad idea about what is actually the presence of water in the country the surface water the ground water then i would go to the actual uh, you know advantages of this industrial uh, you know reuse recycle and all based on different uh, policy documents that have been released by the government of india and other agencies and then slightly talk about our jal jeevan mission which would be of some use to some of your participants and then how actually we need to replenish this source so this would be my uh, way i would go about no talking it uh, talking about water nobody can i mean the only source of water is you know rainfall we get around 1183 mm of rainfall per annum which results in about 3880 billion cubic liters of meters of water by the way 1 billion cubic meter means 1 kilometer cube of water so you can assume 1 kilometer by length 1 kilometer by width and 1 kilometer by height so this is the water we actually get get on the surface of india 328 million hectares of this country out of this, unfortunately, after the WAPO transformation, we can use only 1869 billion cubic meters of water, which is available for us at different forms. But because of your, uh, you know, geographical and topographical issues, we can use only 1123. And surprisingly, if you see the present water use of us is roughly around 710 uh, billion cubic meters, out of its industry, uses just 37 percent this is an estimate by the national commission for integrated water resources management uh, it says it, it works out to only 5.2 percent of the total water that we actually use in the country surprising really and the projections for 2025 you know we need around 1123 bcm a billion cubic meters out of which again industry would be using 67 which works out to roughly eight percent and in 2050 uh, we would be using around 1180 bcm and an industry would be using around 8.7 percent or around let's say 81 billion cubic meters of water so the industry is actually a very little user of water and it's a small player in terms of water use. Uh, you know on uh, the availability of water per se on the basis of the rainfall is continuously going down in the country because of our population and once it used to be around 5,177 cubic meters in 1951, it has now fallen to roughly about uh, 1,300 as on today. And it's likely to go down to 1,140 cubic meter per person in 2050. Surprisingly, all our neighbors, excluding Pakistan, have better water resources. Bhutan has 1 lakh cubic meters of water per person per year. Bangladesh and Nepal around 7,000. Sri Lanka around 2,700. Afghanistan is also even better, 2,058 or something. Only Pakistan, which is around 1,358, is lower than us in terms of water availability. So all our neighbors are comparatively far better in terms of water availability. And you know, in order to and the water use, as we all know, agriculture consumes the maximum. It's 78 percent. Industry, as I told you earlier, it's only six percent. Hardly it is six percent. And domestic water use, that's for water, drinking water, and for other uses is eight and rest eight persons. So what actually we have done so far, you know, to use this water precious natural resource. India, you know, is the third globally largest dam owning country in the world. We have around 5,334 dams and 411 are actually under construction. In fact, uh, per person, 
we have a capacity to store eight 118 cubic meters of water compared to china which has got 576 cubic meters remember we have to understand that india receives 100 percent 180 percent more rainfall than china so obviously we are at a much lower per capita water storage that would ensure a sort of water security for us compared to china some of the countries like Russia has got 5,600 cubic meters storage. Brazil has got 3,347. Australia, 380, 3,180 cubic meters. And USA, 2,260. Even South Africa, they've got 547 cubic meters of storage per person, which ensures a sort of a water security for them. Okay, this is about the surface water. Now, comparing, coming to the groundwater use, perhaps Groundwater as can be said as one of the lifeline of this country's water resource. A series of assessments have been done with the Central Groundwater Board from 2004 to 17, and we have been increasingly using this source, which was 58% used in 2004, and now we are using 63% of the availability. You all will be surprised to know we are using more than double the groundwater use of both US and China put together. So we use around 249 billion cubic meters of groundwater, which is a mind boggling number as compared to the US and China that use around 112 billion cubic meters each per annum, which is again one of the biggest, uh, uh, you know, uh, this has actually led to a lot of states getting over exploited you know, non availability of water. Again, coming to industrial groundwater royal, surprisingly, industry actually uses only 2.38 billion cubic meters of water which is in fact less than 1% of the total groundwater usage. And if you take the most industrialized states like Delhi, Haryana, Punjab, Himachal, and to an extent Tamil Nadu also, the groundwater used by the industry is ranging between 5% to 0.5% and in Himachal it is almost nil. And these all states have you know, groundwater use somewhere between 80% and 85% and above, and even going up to 145% over exploited thing. So obviously our, so out of the 68081 blocks, we have 36% of our blocks in the country are water stressed. Now, there is a definition for water stress. Many of you may be aware of this. If the water availability is less than 1700 cubic meter per capita per annum, we term this as a water stressed condition. And India is already in a water stressed condition. Now, then that rises to the question whether water has become a sort of a limiting factor for a socioeconomic development of the country. It looks like, yes, the answer seems to be yes, because if you see the World Economic Forum's Global Risk Report of 2020, it has recognized 10 things as the long-term things that will impact the output of industry in the next coming 10 years. On the top five are our failure on climate action, biodiversity loss, extreme weather, water crisis, and weapons of mass destruction. Out of this five, Excluding weapons of mass destruction, all other four are linked to water. In fact, water crisis is at the fifth number. And you know, if you know a country like China that controls the Tibetan towers and waters of India, if there is going to be a water conflict, then obviously the weapons of mass destruction would also become water can become one of the causes for the use also for these weapons of mass destruction. This is in terms of risk. Now, estimates of loss of economy. The World Bank estimates that if you don't deploy better water management policies, we may run out of our GDP by almost by 10% by 2050. Many of you know about the Niti Aayog's Composite Water Management Index that predicts you know, 6% loss of GDP due to decrease to water availability. This is again a you know, scenario that really uh, we need to all to address, and I'm sure many of your industry colleagues are already addressing. So in this is a sort of a paradox, you know, the GDP contribution paradox, if you see, Agriculture that contributes almost 20% as per the latest, you know, this year's thing, it consumes almost 78% of water, whereas industry that gives 31% of G GDP, it consumes only 6%. So there is a clear paradox, you know, in terms of water consumption between agriculture and industry. It's really very good that you have taken up the stewardship for, uh, you know, water use efficient works and water recycling and other things. We should really appreciate Ashokam for that. So the mantra for water, industrial water use efficiency is reduce your fresh water consumption using technologies and increase recycle and use as Mr. Ajay, uh, Ajay, Mr. Ajay was already pointing out. So industry actually is relatively a new water user 
and you know recognizing the importance of uh, industry in, in its contribution for economy it's, it's in their own interest actually to reduce the uh, water consumption and some of the studies done by the earlier planning commission in terms of water use by the industry sector says that the potential water saving by the industry sector is almost it ranges between 25 to 50 percent for different types of industry so basically many of the processes that you use consume more water and you know in a closed loop recycling it is a uh, study that it is uh, it is found that you can use almost save almost 90 percent of water and the savings for different types of techniques goes from 90 to 60. If you use an automatic shut off, it saves 15 percent. Then you have, uh, uh, you know, close to loop recycling with treatment saves you 60. Then counter current uh, rinsing, it gives you 40. Spray and jet upgrades, it gives you 20 percent efficiency. Reuse of wash water, 50. So the list is endless. So clearly there is a huge, uh, you know, advantage for industry to adopt this. And one of the first studies further says that the payback period for installing these recovery systems is quite very attractive. In fact, it ranges from 1.05 to 5.5 years for four different industries that consume maximum water, textile, alcohol, food processing, and viscose rayon. So this is the advantage that actually the Achoka would, uh, you know, uh, would be advocating to their uh, uh, industrial uh, partners, the advantages of saving the water. And now I'll let me come to the most important part of our this thing, the mission that we actually work on, which would be of great use to our, uh, you know, members. Actually, you all know that PM announced this 3.6 lakh crore, which roughly translate to, you know, 49.83 billion US dollars, if you use 72.5 rupees conversion rate for providing water supply to every rural household through a tap connection. It's a scheme that has got a huge scale in terms of, uh, you know, numbers to be covered. We have almost 19.19 crore households to be covered. So when we started the mission two years back, we had almost 17% of the households which were having the tap connections in rural areas that in terms of numbers, it is 3.23 crores. But today we are almost on 7.3 crores, which means 38% we have achieved over a period of 15 months, which is, you know, phenomenal in terms of uh, achievement. It's like, you know, from leapfrogging to pole vaulting, that's what we call, it's, uh, you know, something which is unheard of in the history because over the last 70 years, we did 70 per 17, and in just 15 months, we could achieve almost 22%, which you can see for yourself. And, and this this year, we have got almost 50,000 crores of, uh, you know, out, outlet that too, only from central government, an equal amount will come from the states, which means, 70% of this money would go per pipes and industries, the one which would actually be the person who will get stands to get benefited. And apart from this rural rural mission, the government has also launched the urban mission with 2.87 lakh crore. So put together these two missions alone cost around US dollar 92.83 billion in the next two, six years through budget, which is something phenomenal which we are in, in going to invest. In fact, many of you may be aware, US president day before yesterday declared that they are going to invest almost dollar 111 billion for water. And also the 65% would be going for changing the lead pipes that distribute water in the US. So clearly, India is far ahead. You know, we started two years before and US is now, and this 111 billion is going to be over a period of next 10 years, whereas ours is going to be over a period of six years. So clearly, India is going to spend a lot of money on this water. And that would also include a lot of water recycle and reuse also. Fortunately, water is a replenishable resource and we are thankful that it rains and snows every year. And this is one thing that gives us a confidence, uh, you know, that with better use of technology and better treatment facilities and better reuse, we are definitely going to be in a better position to face the risk that might come up because of, you know, this water scarcity that is looming large now. So I just before I end, I just would like to quote the, you know, Dan Sanchet man, the Israeli scientist who won 2011 Nobel Prize for chemistry. And he said, you know, every drop of water you should use twice. So that was the mantra he gave to the world that in 2011, he said, use your drop twice. I'm sure uh, people like, you know, Ion Exchange and all really contributing yes. that to me you know, to use this water twice. And that I'm sure would really almost address the risk factor that comes up with the water. 
I am now, uh, you know, uh, with this, I would like to uh, thank the Shogam for the opportunity that has been given to us to share our ideas on this. And I am open to some questions and further discussions on this. Thank you so much for giving an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Murli Dharan. I think you did a great job of setting the context and, and uh, really amazing uh, numbers and statistics of uh, how serious the situation is. But at the same time, how the government of India is addressing uh, and investing in infrastructure, and I think more importantly that you uh, the point that you brought out that you know it is also an opportunity for the industry. It is going to uh, ultimately we have to all work together to make sure that this important resource is managed uh, excellent code at the end i think about using a drop of water twice i think so pertinent uh, and so uh, thank you sir uh, kindly stay thank on uh, sure yeah uh, we invite our next speaker uh, mr sujay elongowan do we have his slides uh, ready, Neeraji? Yes, uh, Harish will run his slides. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Sujay, uh, wonderful. Mr. Yeah. Uh, uh, Longowan uh, complete, completed his master's in robotics from the King's College London. He is the co-founder of Business Tech Systems Private Limited, which specializes in designing and manufacturing of industrial process water treatment with a focus on developing sustainable and cost effective systems. He has won several awards and um, I'm sure he will enlighten the group uh, and all the members today uh, with the with the uh, latest in industrial process water treatment. So over to you Sujay. Thank you so much sir. Uh, good evening one and all present here. Uh, I would like to uh, talk about our zero liquid discharge systems and in particular uh, industry case study which should be of very uh, very valid at this point of time uh Arisa, can you run my presentation <laughs> so we are talking about one particular case wherein we recover water from spent coolant uh so this this is more of an industrial application as you guys know so, so can we just run through again so I'm just going to talk about four or five points and I'm going to keep it very short and uh, very, very comprehensive. So I want to stress upon what sustainability is all about, as all of you might be knowing. And I want to walk through what the traditional spent coolant treatment and its challenges are. And I want to talk about what sustainable spent cool, coolant treatment and one case study and, and our inferences from that case study. So we all know sustainability is important. I, I, uh, we all heard about Murli Rancher's statistics. We know about, uh, we, uh, we, we heard about Ajay Popitzer's work in the industry. So I, I will talk, I mean, it's just a brief definition. We all know sustainability is all about existing, coexisting together constantly. So this is what sustainability is all about. So I would like to have the sustainability for our spent coolant water which we are trying to recover up to 90 percent of it so let's dive into the case study so next slide okay so this is our traditional spent coolant water treatment system as you know it starts with a oil trap to remove the excess floating oil then goes to the equalization chamber where there is uh, lime alum poly which is put into the uh, equalization tank and after primary sedimentation it goes to the mixer and the uh, flocculation chamber where you have flax mixers and they they get flocculated and mixed and then you have the superintendent which has uh, icod and that requires oxidation so you have anaerobic or anaerobic ox oxidation then the water is taken into a pressure sand filter and a activated carbon filter Afterwards, it's passed through the RO and then the permeate is used for the process. The RO reject is fed into an evaporator to recover water and then the residue is further crystallized. So this is the traditional treatment. 
So this is the flow of the traditional treatment process. You can see how how big and how hectic it is. So let me talk about the alternate or the sustainable treatment process. Next slide, please. So I have a small comparison here. So the traditional treatments process, you need a large footprint. Whereas a vacuum distillation process, you need a very, very small footprint. There is a high OPEX and high runtime cox. Your OPEX is very, very low because it is just electricity. Uh, in vacuum distillation, you can custom customize the unit just by a replacement of a sensor and few programming. But in a traditional system, it is usually built uh, built in and then the capacity, etc., cannot be customized. And the other other uh, benefit is there is only one high quality moving part in the vacuum distillation system. So chances of failure are very, very less and the cost per liter is very, very low as well. So this is how the vacuum distillation system uh, spent coolant treatment looks. So we have a bell filter to skim off the oil and the, and it is fed into the ZLD system. And then the water coming out of the system, the oil separator takes out the floating oil and then the distillate is passed through an optional sand carbon filter that depends on the uh, water usage or the characteristics of water required for reuse. And then the distillate is fed back into the process. So this is a very simple, straightforward process. And next slide. So we can see some case studies. So this is the input oil. This is from a company in Bangalore where we have supplied our system. So the in input oil has some floating oil on top. We remove the floating oil, put it into our system, and that is the output. And this is the residue. Here, residue is oil which can be uh, which can be sent to an oil recycler for reuse, or uh, you can re recalibrate the oil and then use it for other secondary lubrication purposes. So it, it still has its use. So we are talking about 100% resource recovery and water recovery. So our inferences and observations from this particular case study was uh, the space required was reduced by five times when we adapted this treatment system. Energy consumption was a max of around 37 kilowatt hour per meter cube. Uh, the system was not labor intensive and it was totally automated. Sludge bed requirement was not there, whereas in a traditional process, there's a lot of sludge coming out. You need a disposal system for it. And 90% was recovered. 90% of the water was recovered, being 5% input coolant concentration. And the water was reused back in the coolant preparation process. So thank you. And if there's any question, I can take them. Uh, Ajay ji, your, uh, you had a question. You're muted, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it's a nice concept, uh, Mr. Sujay. I just had one question. Uh, what is Please, the, what exactly is uh, the process which treats? Because you showed a flow diagram and you showed one uh, sure. vacuum distillation. How does it actually happen? So, one, it, two, uh, is it able to treat uh, free oil, emulsified oil? Uh, what type of oil it is treating? Okay, the spent coolant process is more of an emulsion process. So it is an emulsified oil process, as you're aware of it. I mean, uh, there's no education from me required to you, so you, you know it better. So emulsion, that is emulsified oil. And uh, right. as you actually mentioned, so this is basically a va vapor recompression system, wherein we reuse the energy back. And it is it runs on a single prime mover. Mm -hmm. So it's basically a vacuum displacement system, as I mentioned. So what does it do? Does it act with the emulsified oil or what does it do? So the it, it pulls out water out of the emulsified oil, leaves, leaves the oil as residue, which can be reused. And this water, whatever is pulled out, is compressed and then reused back. I mean, it, it gives this energy back to the system and then comes out as a distillate. So yeah, because, you know, why I asked about emulsified and free oil is that picture sir. that you showed showed oil uh, sitting down at the bottom. So emulsified oil generally floats on the top. So that was my question. So when you apply your process, uh, you yeah. are concentrating it or you are breaking it? No, we are concentrating it, sir. That's the reason the residue has oil at the bottom and the free oil was on top in the picture. And what is the concentration from what percentage to what percentage? Uh, see, I would say the inlet coolant concentration was around 5%, 1 is to 20 ratio, coolant is to water, and then we were able to achieve around 7 to 8% of concentration. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. With that, uh, let me invite our next uh, speaker.
Mr. Aniket uh, Pagade is the regional sales manager of Pure Water, and uh, 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 he is very skilled in technical product sales for aquaporin forward osmosis technology, and is responsible for developing this technology in the Indian market and identifying the applications of this technology in Indian manufacturing process and industries. He's got a chemical engineering background from Bharatiya Vidya Peet College of Engineering. So over to you, Aniket, uh, for your uh, presentation, please. Thank you, Kalendra, sir. Uh, so can I get the host, right, presenting rights? Yes, you have now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, so basically, we at Pure Water Enterprises are you know, leading distributors of world premier water tech companies, and uh, we are being trying to connect all the technologies uh, to the industries. So coming to our principals, Aquaporin, uh, they are a water tech company based in Denmark who had successfully tried to channelize biotechnology in wastewater treatment. So coming to the patent of forward osmosis technology, what aquaporin has done. So aquaporin has uh, used a cell called uh, aquaporin, in which is Anike, named as Aniket, this is Shailendra. Can you make your uh, presentation full screen, please? Yes. Now, is it, yeah. So, uh, as I was talking about the patent of the aquaporin, so aquaporin has used the protein, which is also named as aquaporin, which is generally found in your uh, living cells. So, this protein, what it does, it only allows water to pass and uh, rejects all the contaminant. It is also found in human uh, beings. Uh, for example, if you take off our screen, this protein is also present in human skin. So, which allows only water to pass through it and rejects all other thing present in our body. Uh, so, as we are aware that uh, now uh, we are facing a bit uh, challenges uh, for uh, the water treatment uh, and uh, current treatment processes have ca higher capex and opex and replacing it compulsory uh, uh, is not possible also there are some stringent norms coming with the zld system so such challenges can be solved by using our aquaporin forward osmosis technology so what is a forward osmosis technology? So basically it is a membrane based technology, which uses natural energy that is osmotic pressure as the driving force. So there is no need of any high pressure uh, pumps to extract water from your effluent and works at ambient temperature and very low pressure. So uh, uh, reverse osmosis is already known to our industry, but forward uh, osmosis offers something extra. So basically forward osmosis is a complementary technology to your existing reverse osmosis system. Forward osmosis can handle higher COD and it works on low pressure. The risk of fouling is very low. Forward osmosis has lower return rate compared to your reverse osmosis system. So it helps you to lower the volume of your ZLG systems. Because of no external pressure required, the energy consumption is also low compared to your traditional reverse osmosis system. So how this forward osmosis system works? So this is the forward osmosis uh, membrane in which we are inserting feed from the bottom of the membrane. And there is a something which we call a draw solution. So what is this draw solution? This draw solution is basically a brine solution, which is higher in TDS compared to your feed solution. So what is happening because of the concentration difference between both the liquids, 
your water is transferring from your feed side to your draw side and your draw solution which was the higher tds brine solution is getting diluted and all your contaminants such as cod and color everything is getting concentrated now this draw solution uh, we need to reuse it so we are designing a draw recovery system so this draw recovery system as i told it is a complementary technology to a reverse osmosis system so this draw recovery system we can use as a reverse osmosis system high pressure reverse osmosis system in which uh, we are designing such a way that the reject which we are getting from the reverse osmosis system we are recycling back as a draw solution and the permit we are using it uh, for back to the processes so advantages of this technology uh, is uh, we get high rejection because of aquaporin cell used in it smaller footprint because of the con compact design higher recovery of clean water uh, because it can handle cod up to 90000 ppm so this is uh, how where we could apply this forward osmosis technology so uh, initially in etp we have primary treatment secondary treatment then tertiary treatment for in primary and secondary treatment we basically do cod treatment if your cod does not consist of solvent and uh, a suspended solid you can just put it to forward osmosis because this forward osmosis technology can handle cod up to 90000 ppm and you can concentrate it and then reuse the water by passing it to a reverse osmosis system in uh, the benefits of applying forward osmosis in zld or existing zld systems are you can see uh, in the after ro we are sending effluent to evaporator basically in zld systems so this ro concentration are generally up to 25 to uh, 30000 ppm in tds so evaporators are basically designed from 50000 ppm to be uh, uh, for better operations so the, uh, if we apply forward osmosis solution over here so what happens is your evaporator uh, forward osmosis is concentrating your uh, ro reject and reducing the load of your effluent as it can handle higher cod's also because uh, your cod is getting concentrated as you are passing through the reverse osmosis system and then uh, you can reuse more uh, because of this fo solution after your ro you are getting higher recoveries as you are extracting more water and your evaporation load is getting reduced so these are few case studies uh, for a wool industry a wool and uh, cotton industry uh, they are dyeing you unit they used to uh, discharge the effluent directly and for transportation they used to take a the transportation was a bit difficult for them so what we had done is we had concentrated uh, using fo to minimize the waste volume and reuse water with minimal need of treatment so 95 percent of water was re, uh, extracted from the effluent and the color uh, and the feed effluent was getting concentrated and that concentrated effluent uh, they were able to transport easily uh, we uh, the, we had also tried with the nasa they they had uh, used this uh, forward osmosis technology for the gray water treatment where the draw regeneration system they were used as seawater reverse osmosis system so for initially uh, they had used this water for toilet flushing and uh, pre filtration so 85% of water recovery we had achieved uh, using this uh, forward osmosis and aquaporin membrane had showed a superior performance for the uh, because of the aquaporin inside available in that also now this is a case study of a pharmaceutical effluent uh, in pharma industries, uh, there are high COD and high TDS effluent, which are consist of solvents and low molecular boiling point compounds. So even after uh, do evaporating it in their condensate, they are founding higher CODs up to 4000 to 5000 ppm and TDS is all, uh, very low. But uh, because of such high COD, they were not able to reuse this water and they are recirc recirculating it back to their uh, it effluent treatment plants. 
So after introducing forward osmosis technology on this condensate, they are able to reuse uh, maximum of water because this COD they we can be uh, concentrating using the forward osmosis solution, and uh, the remaining uh, reject was also very low. So that's from my side. So I am free for any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Aniket, uh, for a short and a nice presentation on the forward osmosis. Uh, Ajay ji, you're the expert, so I'll defer uh, first, obviously, the first question to you, uh, and then we'll open it up uh, to the floor uh, for right. any questions that come from there. Yes. Right. Yeah. So do you want to, uh, Ajay ji, ask any question of uh, the presenter? Uh, no, I think uh, it's a good technology uh, for yeah. osmosis as what Mr. Aniket uh, presented because yeah. uh, it has a place in the whole uh, ZLD because uh, when someone sets up the ZLD, as I said, that you have set up close to about 20 ZLDs, but this ZLDs have been set up uh, uh, amongst uh, uh, with companies who could afford to put up such expensive zero liquid discharge plants. And when I say expensive, it is not the biological and the membrane process, but it's the terminal evaporator, uh, which makes the whole concept expensive, both with respect to capex and opex. So mm. post uh, the biological and membrane process, where one concentrates the reject in an evaporator, if one were to use a, a concept like uh, forward osmosis, which uses less energy for concentration, one can reduce the size of the evaporator and the operating cost. Provided uh, the cost of uh, forward osmosis is uh, comparable to uh, multi effective operator process, both with respect to capex and opex. Uh, so, these two things are important. Otherwise, as a concept, uh, it certainly concentrates, as Mr. Pagade said, from 7% to 12%, and in fact, uh, uh, even up to about 14%. So we have run a pilot which is going up to about 14%. That is not important. Uh, important thing is it's concentrating from 7 to 14%. But what one must keep in mind is that how affordable its cost will be compared to any operator. Absolutely. I think that was uh, exactly what I was thinking when the uh, thing was going on. Whether uh, the cost economics. Ajayji, uh, uh, is is uh, you know obviously product recovery is a key thing because you know you're you're recovering raw materials you want to use it back into the system, but uh, uh, the the water part as a resource and we have seen numbers of ninety nine and, and some some cases high as ninety five percent water recovery, and um, they, would it be correct to say then? that the 5% is evaporation losses or how does one account for that? Because these are all closed loop systems, aren't they? Right, they are closed loop systems. So what you finally recover, the final uh, uh, 5 to 8% uh, which comes out of a ZLD system is uh, nothing but salt. Because uh, what we are doing exactly in a ZLD system, uh, Shalendra ji, is that uh, we are taking an effluent we are stripping off uh, the organic part, we are stripping the suspended solids, we are stripping oil and grease. And then finally, uh, in the RO and things like evaporators or FO, we are now stripping off the salt. Right. So when you strip the water of suspended solids, organics, oil and salt, you are recovering 95 to 98% water. And what wow. you are finally stripping off is uh, basically salt. So what comes out of the system, uh, particularly the uh, uh, system which uh, uh, reduces TDS, that is the membrane process or evaporator, uh, is basically salt. Whereas in, in, the, in the prior system, uh, you are removing oil, as I showed in Reliance case, that we did right. biological pretreatment. In the pretreatment, right. different types of oil. Then right. in the uh, physicochemical, we removed uh, certain contaminants and there was a precipitation done. And then in the biological process, we removed certain amount of sludge. And then finally, uh, you know, we had the RO, which removed certain amount of TDS. So all right. together, the system recovery, if you're feeding, let's say, 100 liters, you can expect in a ZLD close to about uh, 92 to 95. 5%. Okay. All right. That's, that's very helpful. Uh, one question uh, from the chat box uh, that's been posted, uh, Mr. Murli Dharan. 
Um, if you are, are you there with us? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, this this may be a little sensitive question, Mr. Murli Dharan, and uh, but it it came up also in our last webinar, which yeah. is this whole issue of water pricing, you know, and how how it should be priced. Is it currently priced okay? And uh, would you want to share, you know, some views on this or uh, your thoughts on this? I know, you know, this is this is a much much larger uh, question. But where I come from, Mr. Murli Dharan, is that, uh, you know, nowadays water is being traded on the New York Stock Exchange, right? Yes. There is yes. a futures available on water. Yes. So at some point, the pricing question will come here. So your views on that, sir? See, first of all, uh, the policy of Government of India as far as pricing is very clear, whether it is for irrigation or for drinking water. It says yeah. that you should at least recover a minimum operation and maintenance cost. That's the right. first step that the water policy says. So that is the thing. Now the question is, are we really recovering it or not? That mm. is the second question that actually comes up. Unfortunately, the answer is no in many cases. To some extent, in yeah. some utilities, they do. Uh, like, yeah. for example, the utilities in Chennai and Bengaluru, this uh, Metro Water and uh, Bangalore Water Supply and Sewerage Boards, uh, they sell some of the treated water to the industry. Almost both of them have got almost 100 MLD plants and they recover some money through cross subsidy and other things they work. But by and large in rural areas, uh, what we, through mission we want to do some sort of a reforms in this process because this is still yet to take off. So this is being approached through two ways. One is there is a 15 finance commission funds that is available to the gram panchayats, which is given to them. So, and 60% of these funds are already tied to water and sanitation. So, no yeah. gram panchayat can spend the money other than water and sanitation only. It's the amount that is available for the next five years is almost 17,117 70, crores, right? And this year it's almost going to be around 22,000 crores money. So, we want the gram panchayats to spend this money. No, for operation and maintenance, so that some money comes and then these systems are sustainable. That's what right. the second way is through the reform process in our Jal Jeevan mission. We have told that no scheme will be implemented in the Gram Panchayat if there is an agreement among the Gram Panchayat to fund 5% or 10% of the capital cost as well as pay some water tariffs. So, this is you know, sort of a thing that is has to go on a long way. And, uh, you know, central government has got a little leverage here, except through some sort of financial leverages, because water basically is a constitutionally state subject, and state are yes. the ultimate owners of this. So we have two regulators in the country, water resources regulatory authorities are there in two two places, one in Maharashtra, another in Jain. Even there we find that there are a lot of issues, I don't want to go because this is not a forum for that. Sure, so sure. These are things which would happen, policies are clear. Now, whatever programs that come from Government of India, they all have a reform process, reform agenda tied to them so that the recovery of cost is there and with through you know, an affordable pricing. At the end of the day, we should also have to see water is basically a right to life. In Supreme Court, as in many cases, have told that you cannot stop water to an apartment guy if he doesn't pay a maintenance fund. That's a fact of life. You yeah. can't do that. So we have to provide water, but through reforms, through you know other mechanisms, leveraging financial uh, incentives and other things. So this is how we want to do and through better services. So that's also what, you know, without providing a service, you can't expect people to pay. So that is also another thing. we need to improve our services also, and that is also one agenda that we are focusing on in this mission. Right, sir. Right, sir. Thank you so much for that. And I do appreciate it's a very sensitive subject yeah. and, uh, you know, not always easy uh, to comprehend. Uh, thank you so much for that, sir. Uh, there's a question on the chat box for Sujay about the cost of treating seawater to portable water using vacuum distillation process. Sujay, would you have any data or any information that uh, you can share? I sir. Uh, I, I would say that it is very costly if you convert seawater to portable water using vacuum distillation. I think there are other technologies which are uh, much more cost efficient in terms of OPEX and CAPEX because this is basically an energy intensive process comparatively. 
So uh, our, our, th th this technology focuses mainly on the uh, tough to treat industrial waste water streams. For example, degreasing, phosphating, uh, spent coolant, and all the other things. But on the uh, seawater side, it is it, it is costly. I would say. Right. Thank you, uh, Ajay ji. You have installed uh, many of these uh, saline water treatment plants. Would, yes. you, would you have some comments there, sir? Yes. Uh, if you look at uh, the historical perspective of uh, uh, evolution of seawater desalination, uh, Shalendra ji, uh, which yeah. began with uh, obviously uh, uh, Middle East, uh, which was scarce of water. I mean, there was no water at all. So for them, yeah. they had to put a desalination plant. And uh, what was abundantly available with them was energy. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, initially, uh, thermal evaporation processes, something very similar to what Mr. Elongo ones, uh, though I have not understood very well, but I think it would be very similar to uh, vacuum evaporation technology. So there were thermal and uh, uh, mechanical vapor decompression technologies, depending upon what is cheap, whether if steam is cheap or power is cheap, you would use either of the evaporation technology. And that became uh, 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 the workhorse of uh, desalination processes. But somewhere around 80s, with uh, the advancement in membrane technologies, yeah. uh, complete equation changed. And uh, uh, what happened was, uh, if you look at the current inventory of desalination plants, Despite the fact that uh, membranes came much later in the desalination uh, area, but more than uh, overall inventory, even if you do more than 50% plants are based on reverse osmosis. And if yeah. you look at new plants which are being set up up to about 600 MLD or 1000 MLD, almost I would say 50% of them are on reverse osmosis technology. So having given this perspective, uh, the obvious reason for the choice of uh, membrane technology is the cost. The cost of treated yes. water. Yeah. Because yeah. finally, you have to look at the cost of treated water. So yeah. today, the cost of treated water uh, uh, will be anywhere between, uh, if you use uh, RO for seawater, anywhere between uh, uh, 40 rupees to 60 rupees a meter cube. The range of 40 to 60 is based upon uh, the electricity cost, uh, the interest cost to set up the projects. Like, you know, we pay 9, 10%, 12% uh, interest cost. In uh, most developed uh, and Middle East, you know, the interest cost is 2%, 3%. So, you know, it's a very important thing. Then, of course, the energy cost. You know, now we are very competitive with solar and even yeah. with uh, uh, fossil fuels to about, uh, you know, uh, 2 to 4 rupees. Whereas, you know, there the energy cost is even lower. So that's the band between 40 to 60. Versus thermal evaporation technology, something which, uh, you know, I touched upon in ZLD. So if you are looking at, uh, let's say, uh, RO reject coming out of a ZLD plant, which we are concentrating, so that RO reject would be typically about uh, 7% or something. Now to concentrate from 7% to recover water in a operator, the cost is close to about uh, 500 to 900 rupees a meter cube. Ooh, that's expensive. Or yeah. Energy cost, or even if you take steam cost, I mean, it depends which one you select. You can yeah. select fully operation, or you can use mechanical paper recompression. The cost yeah. is as high. So, yeah. uh, uh, obviously, uh, if you want efficiency in desalination, uh, uh, the right thing is uh, RO. And now more so, you know, we heard, uh, you know, Mr. Aniket talking about forward osmosis, which are low pressure technologies. Yeah. And obviously, the energy profiles are lower. But then the cost of the membranes, the cost of the system, and the experience it is still very, very nascent in these areas. It's a promising technology. A lot of work is being done in India also. And yeah. uh, we are also participant uh, in the development of this technology. And hopefully, uh, with experience, uh, we should make more effect. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, just if I can, you know, uh, a little bit more on that. Um, and, and this question is more hypothetical in nature, uh, yes. but it will be very interesting. We, we talk about, you know, Mr. Murli Dharan talked about the fact that, thank God, we have rain and snow every year, right? So there's water. But the, the big water body that surrounds India with such a large coastline is the saline water. And do you, uh, Ajay ji, see in the next maybe 10 years or 15 years, you know, the technology or the costs coming to a point where maybe that becomes a huge source of uh, resource for us. Do you think that as a possibility at all? Or 
uh, well uh, i'll go two decades back uh, mr shelendra yeah two decades back uh, iron exchange set up uh, the country's first sea water desalination plant you know right. somewhere in early 90s we set up a 1 million gallon per day plant for gujarat uh, electricity board sikka okay and it was in jamnagar and you know jamnagar is an area which is almost uh, close to kutch receiving very less water and as you know thermal power plants in a lot of water okay yeah. so that plant one uh, uh, mgd uh, you know uh, the price was uh, uh, close to uh, something like about uh, 35 crores okay and the energy profile that is the capex and the energy profile was something like about 8 kilowatt hour per meter cube so for rupees if we consider the price of energy uh, the uh, only the energy cost was 32 rupees a thousand liter and the capex yeah. was like 35 crore wow uh, to scenario 20 years back when we set up the biggest uh, desalination plant uh, which is chennai petroleum corporation limited uh, it's a 26 mld plant Uh, uh you know uh, the per mld cost uh, has come down to something like about uh, 8 to 9 crores it was 14 and the treated water cost has also come down by almost about 40% right. this is because uh, membranes have become more efficient uh, membranes are of course now made in india by us so you know they are also cheaply available Uh, there is a lot of experience which has come up in terms of engineering efficient from uh, efficient membranes energy recovery devices you know because the reject comes out has a lot of energy and you can recover it so the energy profile has now come down to something like about in the plant that we built is close to about 3.5 kilowatt hour per meter right so it was 8 kilowatt hour per meter cube at 4 rupees which is 3 rupees a meter cube now it is about 3 rupees a meter cube okay right. so it desalination has become affordable not only for sea water but also for concepts like zd and Absolutely. You must understand that it's only one tap. Okay. Right. The best, tap, the best tap is what uh, nature has given us, and as what Mr. Right. Murli then gave fantastic statistics at the amount of rainfall. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know we are blessed with in our country. Okay. And if we do enough capture, uh, we uh, do rainwater harvesting as what Chennai is a fantastic example. Okay. Where almost every household since last two decades uh, captures its rainwater. and the moment they started doing this the rain gods were also kind you know uh, <laughs> i don't think that chennai saw a drought after uh, you know uh, 2003 or 4 uh, and you know so uh, if that is one thing and the second thing is we can consider this as alternate sources of water exactly uh, you know, like sea water uh, uh, sewage uh, is alternate source effluent is alternate source and there's right. enough experience enough references to make them affordable also now Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. That was really, really. And yes, sir, Mr. Molly, sir, please. Uh, one interesting point, since uh, uh, Mr. Rajay spoke about desalination. See, the cost can come down at the plant level, but imagine we are distributing it through a pipeline that leaks at forty percent. Wow. So, in one assessment, we found in one state. I don't want to take the name. The loss per day was six lakhs. Loss. Wow. so we need to be very careful when you are actually taking that water through pipelines because you are putting almost 50 rupees 55 rupees per kilo liter and then putting it in a pipeline which leaks at 30% or 40% you become penny wise and pound foolish absolutely and i fully agree with mr ajay that we need to do the rainwater harvesting which government has again done this jal shakti abhiyan in 2019 and catch the water where it falls right the third thing which i would like to close with a quote from rig ajurved which says that amritam va apaha amritasya anantarikte which means let the water be there forever and let it not get destroyed so industry really actually is doing the second part they are not allowing that to be destroyed by recycling and reusing it so kudos to you and in fact you are like a hungry person you are actually a latest entrant for water consumption and yeah. with you at least you are willing to share one with others whereas others take 10 and they don't want to do efficient work i don't want to <laughs> so that's why you know i really appreciate yeah. you for thanks thank you no no that was that was really nice and uh, thank you for your vote of confidence uh, i'm sure the industry will always rise to the occasion there are uh, several other questions on the chat box there are several pointers about you know agriculture being a, a more 
consume our water and we should do something there. I just wanted to say that we will have a session that will cover that aspect uh, of it uh, very soon. Uh, please stay tuned for some of the uh, webinars that are going to come in the future. Uh, with that, uh, with, a, with a very warm and generous heart and big thank you to all our panelists and speakers, let me hand over the proceedings uh, to Sri Arora ji uh, to propose the vote of thanks. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. And that is so carefully. I mean, uh, it is all five of you, but I still want to listen to our evidence speakers. Uh, so, uh, uh, thank you so much. Thank you much, Murli uh, Dharan. Uh, it was really amazing to uh, hear the statistics and, uh, from you, and your talk was very knowledgeable. So, thank I you. must congratulate you, and I, I think all the speakers will and attendees will congratulate you. You know, for sharing uh, so much, you. you know, accurate facts and figures with us. And you are absolutely right, sir. If we can preserve our, uh, you know, natural water, which is, you know, given us. Uh, God, every year, if we can preserve that water, it would be sufficient enough for all of us. Sure. So, uh, thank you so much, Murli Dharanji, for sparing your valuable time. And thank uh, you. you said that HM and associations members are uh, working with the Ministry of Jal Shakti, and we are always there to you know, uh, uh, work hand in hand with the Ministry of sure. Jal Shakti. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. And our uh, industry experts, uh, especially Mr. Ajay Popatji, Mr. Aniket, and Mr. Sujoy, they have shared uh, various technologies that are being used uh, in the industries nowadays. So it was wonderful uh, hearing all the speakers, and uh, especially uh, Sharendra Singh ji. Last time I missed to extend my vote of thanks to you, uh, but you really moderated the session very, very well, sir. So uh, I mean, पता ही नहीं लगा कि 90 minutes कैसे हो गए. And particularly, sir, uh, I belong to building industry, and I would like to share that uh, I mean, buildings are definitely consuming lots of water, not only during construction, but post occupancy as well. So, if we are using very simple procedure, simple steps, not that big, I mean, we were discussing about today. So, if you are uh, doing rainwater harvesting, if you are installing sewage treatment plants, if you are doing dual plumbing, if you are reusing the treated water in the toilets, flushing, car wash, and you know, very simple, simple steps, we can save around 45% of potable water demand of the building. So, which is a huge, huge number. I mean, uh, you know, if you talk about the areas like Gurgaon, NCR, or, you know, Chennai, where we have lots of uh, population density. So, where we, you know, and I particularly, I belong to Jaipur and Rajasthan. So, we can understand the value of, you know, e even a single drop of water. So, uh, I think it's a joint effort by building industry and our other industries. So, that we can save our uh, most precious uh, natural resource, which is water. So, uh, thank you so much, all the speakers, for joining us. And friends, uh, we have our uh, third Arora. webinar in the series. Uh, uh, Mr. Arora, can I take my mic? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, uh, first of all, you are such a fantastic administrator of uh, programs and time. So you completed right on time. But I have just one suggestion. Uh, taking off from uh, where Mr. Mudan uh, 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 talked about uh, non-revenue water or this leakage of water. And there is lots which is being done in that area in terms of technology and uh, public private participation. The second thing is very importantly what you have said about uh, you know the building industry, and you have rightly said that the building industry you know recycles its sewage, sillage, uh, and also sometimes solid waste. Okay, so why don't you have one program uh, on SOCAM on uh, non-revenue water with uh, Mr. Murli Dharan, you know, uh, uh, and Mr. Shalendra ji, you know. Uh, co chairing it and uh, you know uh, another program on uh, you know the building industry uh, bringing an awareness about how they can conserve water how they can convert waste into energy etc etc so you know it is it is very important to address these two, two things also because the last two series have been fantastic including today and the third one which you are going to announce is going to cap it up but if we can have one more uh, also uh, covering these two aspects, I think the whole series will become uh, complete. It's my suggestion. Definitely, sir. Uh, your suggestion is uh, very well taken. So, Shalendra ji, let's work out, uh, you know, uh, one webinar uh, uh, with the support of, uh, you know, Minister of Shakti, where we Absolutely. can cover the topic proposed by Ajay ji. So, it can be really wonderful. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah. 
So I totally agree. I think great suggestions, and we'll definitely work on it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. And we can have, and we so can so have somebody like uh, the Indian plumbing uh, industry because you know what Mr. Murli Dharan said that we must save every drop of water. We should not allow it to leak because not only it's precious otherwise, but when you treat and when you bring it, it becomes even more expensive. So, you know, plumbing is equally important. Quality of plumbing is important, uh, which also causes leakages, affects the properties. And then, of course, water management, as I say. So we could, you know, make a program, uh, uh, you know, bringing in all the stakeholders together. We'll discuss about it uh, if it's acceptable to you as a suggestion from my side. This is very well taken, sir. And you are right. When taking a drop of water, I mean, it's, uh, energy is also associated with it. Right. Energy so and we, want to hand, the you know, we are uh, you know, again in the environment. Yeah. yeah, we want to make the best use of cycle experience you know. also, Ji. Mm -hmm. building line ka experience hai, we want to make the best use of it because you got the right connects over there. Okay, yeah. and we could take it further. Yeah, and definitely, sir. Definitely. Uh, so we can do a joint program with the we can invite the experts from so full so webinar in the series we uh, water setting community stakeholder management so it's our third and last webinar of the series and definitely we will do uh, more such knowledge series on on water and wastewater management and water management uh, as suggested by ajay ji so uh, do join us uh, on uh, wednesday 14th pm again i would like to uh, you know even in the working days, 3.30 p.m. or 4 p.m., this was really excellent. I mean, I was not expecting such a good response uh, for the webinar, particularly at this part of this part of time. So thank you so much once again, our dear attendees, for uh, joining us uh, for this webinar. And thank you so much once again, our eminent speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mr. Shalendra, Mr. Arora, you, one boss. question. Uh, I saw a lot of questions which were there in the uh, chat box. You could just direct it to me uh, uh, with the names of the people, and I will try best to reply to them and maybe the other speakers also. Uh, yeah. Because uh, many, there were very interesting things which were coming up, but I think we have to manage time also. So, uh, Absolutely. To them. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. We will, uh, we will you. share the, the questions with the names and email ID uh, with you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sujoy. Thank you, Monitor. Thank you. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Yeah,